Hello, hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you are listening to the Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm chatting with Annette Cardwell. Annette is the Senior Director of Content, Community, Customer, and Web at Lattice. Previously, she worked at several media companies, including Brit & Co., Fandom, and Yahoo. In this conversation, we go deep on media marketing, what it is, what it isn't, how it actually looks at a company like Lattice, and how modern content marketers can make the shift. She actually walks through her own framework uh, called Crawl, Walk, and Run, where she ladders up through various stages of building a media company and shows you how you can build a media content program internally. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Annette Cardwell. So like you mentioned, uh, you've got a background in journalism, building media companies. And I actually listened to a previous podcast you did um, where you talked about being attracted to Lattice because a previous head of marketing expressed they wanted to build a media company within Lattice. So yes. what does that mean to you to to approach content like a media company? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, when you're a journalist, you really are all about like, how can I translate um a topic, whether it's super interesting and you want to get across why it's super interesting, or you want to take something dry and complicated and make it more interesting for like a mass audience, right? You want to get as many eyeballs on your content as possible on your, on your journalism, on your writing. And I feel like that is a maybe missing element to a lot of content teams in marketing um, is that you, even though your audience is more defined and more like specific, especially like the audience that's likely to buy your product or whatever it happens to be, um, the more you can get into the top of the funnel is always great, right? That's why we do SEO as a strategy. That's why we do all the, you know, we, we, we are looking for as many interested parties as we can. And so media does that one thing very, very well. They don't always run companies very well, bless their heart, but they do sometimes like they do hit the mark on like, how do I get as many people to pay attention to my content? And I'm not talking about clickbait and these other sorts of things. It's more just like, how do I form like a brand, first of all, for my content? And then how do I, and therefore like for my company in a lot of ways, right? <clears throat> like the New York Times, or Box, or Refinery29, you name it. And then how do I take that uh, brand and make it into content across all these different channels of, of, of ways people consume content? So the most basic one is obviously like the, the blog or articles, right? And um that's also the same for content teams on on that are in marketing. Like we all have some form of a blog or you know a content engine where we're putting out written content that's primarily used to drive SEO value, right? And so that's a really shared approach from media to marketing, right? Um, we all want to own the conversation, you know. It's uh, if like the goal of content teams, regardless of what format it's in is storytelling. Um, the storytelling aspect of like the blog is like really like how do I get the most people who are looking for my topic into my into my sites, into my funnel or whatever it happens to be. Then like there are a lot of other ways that you can extend that voice, that storytelling out beyond the blog. So when I started at Lattice, like I had, I put together like a little bit of a presentation for the execs who I met with when I was interviewing. And I literally called it like a crawl, walk, run approach to building the media company within Lattice. And the blog is the crawl. Like you have to like build the content engine that is going to power an SEO strategy. And the way that you win at SEO is volume in a lot of cases. And quality and depth, right? So um, when I was running content at Britain Co., which is a women's lifestyle media company, um, we had like, we want to own the conversation around food and recipes and 
um, you know, certain like aspects of like longer tail content on fashion and so on. So we had like a very specific directive and it's just like a keyword strategy that you would run in B2B marketing, right? For SEO, you want to identify like, where can I own the conversation? Like, what are my like easy bets? Like I'm already owning the conversation and I just want to maintain that ownership. Where can I, um, where are some opportunities where no one's owning the conversation and I can own it? Or, and then there's like the big bets of like, where's my competition owning the conversation? And I want to take back some of that, that voice. So there are like, uh, that's the crawl. Like, and you start by like, how do I increase my output of content from, you know, you go to like zero to 10. And then it's like, now we are at Lattice up to like 20 articles a month. And so that's like, a really big output, but some of those are updates and so on. Those so are all sorry. Piece. Those are all SEO focused, or is that like uh, do you have different approaches with those twenty pieces? I try to think about everything as needing a bit of an SEO focus, regardless. But no, it's not all. There is definitely like a workload. Like uh, there's definitely like a a work board that we have that's like all just um, SEO specific top of funnel topics. But then there's also like topics that we're doing specifically because we're launching a new product area. And so like we just launched a compensation product and we didn't have any content on that before. So we had to like actually start creating more value and ownership over topics that are in this new area. And sometimes it's like around like a specific event that we're going to do. So we want to do more themed content Sometimes it's we want to like uh, win new audiences in new verticals, like new regions, new industries. So we need to like create a volume of content that specifically like that audience is searching for. Mm -hmm. So um, even though some are different business objectives, we try to look at all of it through a little bit of an SEO lens, knowing that longer term, we're going to want to own those topics. Okay. So the base is like the SEO, the blog, the central kind right. of like produ- production flow. That's the crawl. And then right. what's the walk stage? So the walk is how do we create new channels of content that gain new audience? So for us, the first step was events. Um, content, ha- great content makes great events. That's like the bottom line foundation. Like uh, you can put on webinars all day, but if they're not interesting, if they're not delivering expertise or like a particular point of view, or they're not like timely in like a smart way, nobody's going to tune in. Nobody's going to sign up. Nobody's going to recommend it to a friend. No one's going to share it. Like forget about it. And like, it was so funny because when I come from media to marketing, like, um, I was actually like surprised and like, really people tune into webinars. I, I don't know about you, but like, that's the, that was like a funny, like aha moment to me, but I was like, I want to be the best webinar there is out there for my audience and their topics. I want it to be as compelling. I want it to have the best speakers. I want it to have the most high quality, like experience in terms of like recording and format, um, all the things. So it's all about like creating experience out of and content powers that experience. Right. So uh, we took over as a content team, like uh, determining what topics uh, all of our scheduled webinars would be. Uh, We took over the content for our conferences. Uh, So that's a little bit more of a run, I would say, but it's sort of like a walk to run. It's like a fat, Mm -hmm. you know, speed, speed walking. Um, But we really like, you know, like our first virtual conference that we did, this was before uh, COVID, like we got Kim Scott to come on and give like a whole seminar on radical candor and, you know, so on. But then like when we actually went full virtual, it was like, okay, how do we make our event pop? And it's really about like the content that we're putting into that space. So we booked like Trevor Noah to come and did do a talk about DEI. And um, we, you know, we had 
like recent, more recently we had like Adam Grant and Serena Williams come be part of our, so it's all about like, how do I program the best show that my audience is going to see as a must see, a must consume, a must share really. So events is a huge part of your voice. It's a huge part of your content strategy. Um, it's a tough one because not all teams are willing to share that value, right? Like, cause every, I think a lot of marketing teams have events teams within and the events team tends to either outsource or do the content themselves, but having a content hand in the selection, cause you want your company to understand, I understand this audience best. And so I'm, I know the topics that they're talking about. I know the angles that will appeal to them the best. Like, are they more conservative? Are they more progressive? Like, how do I frame the conversation so that it feels really palatable to that audience that's going to consume? So events was definitely like our second sort of, our, our first step into the walk. Mm-hmm. Do you get big name speakers for all the webinars too, or is that just for the big conferences? <laughs> so it depends on our goals. So if we, if demand is trying to like do a, a massive like push into uh, like, oh, let's try and get like massive RSVPs for this one webinar per quarter. So like last year we did a series called one-on-one um, that where we wanted to get like three to 5,000 RSVPs for each webinar. So we knew that we would need some kind of premier name to draw those kinds of RSVPs. So um, we, we did that. We had like Chris Yeh, who's an author of it come in and uh, actually Kim had Kim Scott had just come out with her new book about DEI and we had her come on to talk about DEI. And so it, it w- I would say it was like sort of like um, a higher caliber of guests than we usually have. And we did like have budget set aside to mm-hmm. pay them to come. Um, but that was because we had high goals. And so I think you have to just think about what are your goals for your webinars? Can like just a panel of practitioners, like HR leaders, in my case, um, drive that kind of sign up. And if not, like, what can you do to like, move the needle with through guest selection? So it it sounds like big names do help draw a crowd, which makes sense to me. But let's like leave that dimension aside. What? Because we're we're doing a lot of events, right? Like we do webinars, and we're planning like a pretty big event, uh, three day kind of virtual summit. So yes. what are the the secrets to good mm-hmm. good product in terms of like your events like topic selection how mm-hmm. they actually present like what are what are the other things that actually make good events good Yes a lot of preparation and good guest selection is is like the first step right and guest selection doesn't have to be prim- like like famous people it can literally be just people who are super knowledgeable um like our like one of our um, one of our first virtual events we did um, out of, in in pandemic, we were like really focused on like what are the companies whose leaders we would want to hear from, mm-hmm. or who are actually doing like innovative things that have like great stories behind them. So it's it, it was more about like curating great stories and and voices than like. Some of it is like I would go on and listen to them on a podcast and, oh, they they have this great story and they're really fun. And or I'd go see a talk that they did and, you know, in in the before times um, where it was like, wow, they're super engaging. They have this great presentation that goes along. And so you have to do a bit of homework to find those those voices and those stories for sure. Um, and sometimes they'll pitch them to you. Right. If, especially if you develop like a little bit of a name or you do a shout out on your socials or whatever, um, apply to speak. And you can usually come across some really great gems that way. Um, then like preparing the speaker. So if you have a moderator, right, making sure that person really knows how to 
do it right. Cause like a, a good host or moderator can make or break Alex, as you probably know, um, a conversation and then, um, you know, really doing a bit of like a prep call with those speakers, making sure they understand the flow, all those things like lead to like great experiences later. Cause uh, then there's like no wasted time. Like there's great conversation through and through. Uh, yeah, I like I like to reverse engineer uh, these things to a certain extent and think about yeah. like the opposite. Like, what what is bad about most webinars? Because a lot of <laughs> webinars are bad. They're they're boring or like they're undifferentiated. And then I try to right. do the opposite if I can. And maybe the opposite's also bad. Like that's a test that I'm willing to take. But yes. when I worked at um, a company called CXL, like we we launched like a mm -hmm. webinar program. So we we launched uh, this platform for education called CXL Institute. And I figured, mm -hmm. okay, we've got all these instructors who are practitioners and thought leaders in their fields. Like, why don't we just promote their actual content with a, a, a mini form of content in the form of a webinar? And right. I looked around at all the other webinars and thought like, all right, there's like 20 minute long introductions for some reason and a bunch of background yeah, research yes. and theory. And then there's like a sales pitch that's kind of interweaved yes. through the thing, but then there's, you know, a long one at the end. I'm like, what if I scrapped all that and just like, didn't barely intro them like just let them go they didn't have mm -hmm. slides they just like showed their screen and showed how to do something concretely and made it full of tactical right. wisdom instead of like this fluffy high level thing but mm -hmm. i like that kind of reverse engineered approach and it, this is kind of a long way to ask this question but like no no yeah what what, what are the um what are the pitfalls that you should avoid in terms <laughs> of like webinars like what are the common things i almost yeah. certainly like it's going to be like pushing too hard of a sale or something like that. But what, what else have you seen in terms of like common mistakes marketers are making? I would agree with all the things you've already flagged. Like thought leadership is like really the way to go and not making it too prescriptively like a, any kind of sales pitch is pretty key. Um, people will literally log out and not come back if they feel it's too salesy. And we, um, anytime we have like a little bit of a salesy anything in any of our content, like we get comments back or NPS like back from uh from the like a survey that, that tells us that. So we try to avoid that. And it's like, let's leave that as like, let's like the goal here is really like to make Lattice look like an ally to this viewer, right? We get you, we understand your pain. So, you know, that's, it's very high level and very thought leadershipy. I would also say, um, like, I want to go back to that moderator being a key point, um, mm. knowing how to get out of the way of answers. <laughs> like when people, when you ask a question, let them answer it. I'm so shocked at, I, I, I get like wanting to create um, conversational like a conversational vibe on a podcast and like having discussion, but 90% of it is like knowing when to pull back and like, let them open up and talk. And especially some speakers take a while to, you know, get to the point exactly, but you have to know like when to sort of step in and help and when to just like give it a little room, a little air to breathe and like get the the really good shit out there <laughs> so part of my french so no, yeah no, you can swear it's fine <laughs> okay great um so uh i i do think it's really critical um like uh so many uh sometimes it's just like knowing how like especially if you have like time limits and that sort of thing which like you know webinars i think are tend to be like an, like an hour long or maybe a little less you want to get to a bunch of things. You want to like cover a bunch of topics, but you also just have to like prepare, or this is what I do anyway, um, prepare like which cut questions I'm willing to like give up and cut and which I really, really want the audience to come away with. Front load it with those questions first. Like know if I'm at a certain cutoff point, like to stop asking questions after a certain bit. And, um, and, I also think it's really key to also create some sort of interactivity in web webinars where you can. So we do lots of polling. We collect questions ahead of time from the audience. We take questions always off of the Q&A as well at the end. It's so hard to leave time for that, but um, having interactivity really makes people more invested 
um, and feel more engaged because they just feel like they're being seen and heard and everybody loves that. You know, that cutting skill, that cutting component, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Like um, I think for many people, but for me, I've I've noticed it in an editorial um, lens. And like when I write content, I have trouble writing less than 4,000 words. If it were up to me, (laughs) these podcasts would all be several hours long. I would take like the the like Joe Rogan, you know, five hour long marathon right. conversation style. Yeah. But I know that like, you know, that there's a niche for that, but like, also like, I want to make it palatable to the audience that I'm serving. So, yes. um, I don't know. How do you, how do you it's develop tough. that skill? It's like, it feels more psychological than anything, right? Like being able to like, say this is a five out of 10 idea so that it doesn't yeah. pass my bar of like an eight out of 10 idea. So we're going to scrap that out, even though it might be marginally valuable. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. How do you approach that? Well, I, I think that's the media slash editor in me, right? That's, um, I've always, I I mean, I've come up through all kinds of different kinds of media, but most of what I do is I'm an editor, I'm a curator and curating the message I want. Like when I'm editing an article or an ebook, it's like, this is the primary hook I want the the reader to come away with. And I want everything within it to hang off of that hook. And it makes it much easier to say, this doesn't hang on that hook. You know, I have to cut it. Like, let's just like, cause it really like makes the message cleaner and makes you seem like a more focused, um, uh, a deliverer content creator. Um, if you can do that, if you can sort of like winnow down and, come to, uh, I think so, but there are obviously moments where you just want to let people like talk, um, and let it be free form. Um, I think it's just being wise about how often you do that in your content mix Mm -hmm. and how often you make it more focused and curated and edited down. So, yeah. I think and it seems like there's some audience points. intelligence there too, which is what you kind of started Fully. with with regards to the media company, really knowing what the audience wants That's and meeting right. those expectations. Because maybe some audiences do want more of the rambling, full length, long form yes. style. And maybe some are like, hey, give me the tidbits, give me the exact summary. So, great example of that is one of my previous jobs is I worked at a company called Fandom, which does pop culture content for very deeply passionate fans. Like, the geekiest of the geeks for sure. And they will listen to a three to five hour podcast about the Simpsons. Absolutely. And about Dr. Who and about star Wars and you name it, they will eat it up and they'll have opinions all along the way. And they will like, thank you for it. On the other hand, like Lattice's employee, uh, Lattice's audience is HR leaders, street, like the number one thing they'll tell you is they're time strapped, they're mm. burnt out. Um, they just need quick help. <laughs> they, they couldn't tell me any clearer, like keep this tight, <laughs> keep this valuable and pack as much in to a small space as possible. And so I have to take those learnings and translate that into the content strategy. It has to be part of it. So like I try to keep ebooks from being overly long. I try to keep um, articles tight and to the point. Um, I try to keep pod like webinars and conference sessions as tight as and neat as possible. But to that end, like our our conference that we do every year, virtual conference, is like seven hours of programming. Like mm-hmm. we start like 8 30 in the morning and we end at like 3 30 in the afternoon we get largely like we get something like 60 percent of people like staying almost entirely till the end oh wow but it's literally because like it's very chunked up it's bite-sized we build in breaks it's like having empathy for your audience and like how their day flows and the needs that they have to fulfill um you know, so we want to like make sure that the content is super relevant, differentiated enough, but also respectful of their time. 
Yeah, yeah. I resonate with the fandom. I think uh, I might be in that nerd audience to a certain extent. Nice. <laughs> I, 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 I loved working there and I still am a fandom consumer. Trust me. <laughs> well, I find it's hard to let you have to like uh, almost let go of some ego to like serve a different audience than yourself. Like I yes. maybe, you know, grew up like reading a lot and like I, I'd play these long convoluted like RPG video games and whatnot. Same. So like, I feel like I yep. <laughs> developed some sort of immersion uh, in, in the media that I consumed. But if we're, mm -hmm. our agency is working with somebody that sells to salespeople, for instance, like they right. might actually love those like LinkedIn thought leadership, you know, three to five tips type content. Whereas yeah. I might spend all of my free time reading a Malcolm Gladwell, <laughs> New Yorker article about like some right. super esoteric thing, but it's like disassociating and actually serving that audience instead of thinking everybody prefers to consume content the way that I prefer to. Yeah. I mean, I think that is like a key starting point for any content marketer, especially one who is going into an area where they don't know the audience very well, like, or can personally relate to the audience very well. Um, I would say like, I, when I started at Lattice, I did not deeply understand the HR audience at all, but really like doing the homework of like, you know, building out those personas, like understanding those people that you're servicing, like um, either they are your buyer, or they could be your buyer, or, you know, they're on the fringe of that. Um, learning what content they consume. So like, I really got to know like specific sort of super users of Lattice when I started and like just spent time having conversations with them. It's like, oh, what do you read? What do you find helpful? What, you know, um, one of those people was like our actual head of people at the time at Lattice. And she was just like, oh, like this, like this, this site usually gives me great stuff, but they like, they get this wrong a lot. And, you know, I love this person. You should just follow them on social and just absorb everything they say. I would love if we could get so-and-so for a conference. You know, it was just like, I was just like a sponge for that information. And slowly it's like, you know, you're learning about a new group of people. It's just like when you walk into a room of strangers and you want to like find some commonality. And um, I found very easy commonality with HR people, which was lovely. I don't know how easy it would be for me to find commonality with like, I don't know, IT professionals. Maybe, maybe I could, but like, that was also a big reason why when you're exploring roles, right, you should think about like mission and an audience and outcomes, because if you can't believe in the audience that you're writing for and like what's interesting about them and their challenges, and you can't believe in the products that your company is making to help those challenges, you're never going to get create great content or build a great content strategy for that need and a story. So I was very, very careful when I was looking for the right role to like, think about those things first. Um, because I like the thing that I love about media and content marketing is making stories, making, making content for an audience. And I need to believe in like the audience and what, what they, what helps them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love the topic of of customer research and learning about the customer. My my background, I worked in experimentation, conversion rate optimization. So it was a huge yes. part of that. And actually, fu funny story, you mentioned the IT thing. Uh, a previous yeah. podcast guest, Ashley Faust uh, at Atlassian, says the mm -hmm. secret to learning about your customers to marry them. <laughs> she she married a software engineer and she's like, I it's great. Like I understand all the pain points and I get to like, you know, put those into my work and content. So totally life hack, I guess. No, our CMO is married to an HR person. So it's like, perfect, perfect. <laughs> she's like a, a, she's like a focus group of one. <laughs> I suppose if you can't do that, if that's not feasible, one right. thing that's beneficial about the media approach is that you've got tons and tons of points, not, not only to distribute content and potentially get customers, but each of these touch points right. like events can be learning opportunities too. Like every conference you throw, you 100%. get to talk to people at the happy hour. You get to see what talks resonate. You get data, actually. Like usually if you like yes. do a post-talk post, post -talk survey and like which ones resonated the most and qualitative feedback as well. So you can start with a hypothesis as to like what your audience cares about and iterate and learn over time. 
You should always do that for sure. And, um, and I mean, I think that's the one thing I probably missed the most during uh, trying to do while I was doing content through COVID is that I didn't have those like casual in-person meetups where you can just hang out afterwards during the happy hour and pick people's brains and hear their gripes and let their, when they let their guard down, um, I, I get, you get a little bit of it in the chat box, you get it in the surveys. Um, but having that touch point of like actually just talking to people. So I did a lot of virtual conversations with different HR leaders and, um, you know, and when we have new personas that emerge, like talking with those people, there's nothing that replaces like just like getting down into a conversation, building a relationship. Um, those things like will really help you understand your audience best for sure. Yeah, yeah. To be transparent, like we started the podcast during the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. largely mm -hmm. for that reason of, of gaining an intelligence as to like what content people are talking about, what pain yes. points are what team structures look like and basically keeping a pulse on what's happening in the industry in absence of all the stuff that we used to do in person, like the conferences and whatnot. And it's been amazing. Right. I'm like, I'm going to do these conversations anyway. Like let's record yeah. them, put them Super out into the helpful. world and make it also a distribution and, and content tactic of our own. But the main yeah. benefit for me is just learning. You know, I get to talk to cool people and, and learn about nice. what Lattice is doing and what Atlassian is doing and all that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's think about like the net, the the run, I guess, like the the fast walk and the runs part of the of the meet of but the before of we go into run. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Go for it. You mentioned that you also played RPGs and video games. <laughs> yeah. Well, I I'm I not like the not like the big expanse of Japanese RPGs, to be perfectly honest. Like I did like a couple of Final Fantasies, but like um, more like a Mass Effect you know, kind of style, um, player. Um, I wouldn't say like, I am deeply, deeply, like, I, I know so many folks that are very deeply into like, um, like I, other, other RPGs, especially Japanese RPGs, but that's just my gaming geek, geeky fandom background. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting. But I'm more I, like an, I'm more an adventure game, like Zelda and. Um, yeah. 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 I like Zelda too. I liked yeah. Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy seven when I was a kid. I haven't played nice. many of these. I'm I'm afraid, honestly, because of how much better games have gotten than the graphics and the storytelling. Sure. They were so archaic back then, but they were still so addicting. But I think uh -huh. that playing those early on actually like influenced how I view storytelling in a weird way. A like good... those are immersive yeah. full length like multi character stories and i think that influenced how i look at storytelling and i always loved like shaping outcomes like i felt i think that's maybe the storyteller in me is like i loved a game that let me drive the story um and like build the character and you know make them you know are they going to be a bad guy are they going to be a good guy you know that sort of thing yeah i love that all right let's move on to run yeah okay let's see so run run is like where you and and not every company wants to do run for content. Let's be real. I just knew that it's like, hey, if you're going to tell me build a media company within Lattice, I want to be able to run one day and like just keep keep making it bigger. So I definitely think like there is a run version of events which I just talked about like the conference, like really like orchestrating not just like who these speakers are and like really like creating a wow factor, but also like working with the events team to like make the overall experience, like the video quality higher, the audio quality higher, like the, the surrounding um, event platform, like really higher experience. Um, like what are the interactive features? How do we involve like our community and that sort of thing? So that's the run of events. I, they're also like other, they're just like, other like higher value, but like not as easily qu as quantifiable um, ways of, of doing content. Like podcasts are one for sure. Um, you can do them for sure in a lower rent kind of way. You can definitely just homemade it, you know, DIY it and put something out very quickly. Um, we, we wanted to go a little bit more upscale. So we worked with um, a third-party vendor, this, these great 
folks called pod people. Um, they help us put together the podcast and uh, like almost soup to nuts. Like I'm pretty deeply involved, but I'm mostly involved with like, who is our host? Like finding a great host. Like for us, it was like, how do we find like an HR influencer who can like really carry our message effectively and still be a fan of our product? Um, so we work with Caitlin Holloway, who is the former head of people at Reddit, and she is now in the VC space. She works for 776, which is Alexis Ohanian's uh, venture firm. Um, so she has this fantastic, really progressive view of HR topics. And she was like the perfect voice for what we wanted to, to get for it. Because like, you can do all the prep and all the scripting that you want for podcasts, as you might know, Alex, but it's really like the beauty is in the conversation and building rapport. And so she was the one that I think people would trust with their story. Um, she also has just an incredible talent for conversation and rapport. So it was just like the perfect mix for our host. So we wanted to make sure her experience was really elevated, that she would want to continue to do it. It would be easy for her to do. And then also like booking really high value guests. Like, so our first season, we started by booking CEOs. And so we had like Gary V and we had, you know, um, we had like uh, leaders from like Figma and from Front and like all these different companies and really like wanted to capture like why they choose to lead people first in their mm -hmm. companies. That And because we had like a specific sales problem where HR leaders said, my CEO doesn't get it. My CEO doesn't understand why this is important. And so it's like, how do we bridge that gap between senior leadership and HR? And so it's like, let's bring on CEOs who just get it and have them talk about why. And, uh, and that was the whole first season. We had like HR leaders sending the podcast to their CEO, especially if it was like a CEO that their CEO looked up to. It was even, even better. Um, then like we evolved in the second season because we, it was a big enough of a hit for us that we were like, let's do a second season. Let's lean more into like model HR leaders and their secrets. And, um, you know, it was more about like, what's the star value equivalent of HR, right? Who are they? We called them HR liberties um, when we were booking. It's like, who is that? And so like the, we got like the head of people for Spotify, who is like this, like Katarina Berg. And she's just very, very, very outspoken on like all these different topics and people love her. So we, we just brought in all these voices from HR. And now this season, we just put out our third, started our third season um, and this time we changed it a little bit further. Like, let's focus in on like specific topics and who is killing it in that space. Like, who is like the model citizen on the four day work week? Who is the model citizen on um, uh, hybrid work arrangements, um, parental leave, et cetera? So um, it, it still carry has like a thread that carries through of like making arguments easier for HR to have with senior leadership, but it also like evolves it slightly so that it becomes like compelling and not one note, you know, from season to season. Well, that that's one thing that I like from how you're describing it is it sounds like there is a theme or a hook, but not a predefined narrative. Like even right. in your first season, you mentioned getting Gary V and a couple other CEOs. And I'm guessing that Gary V's leadership philosophy is a little bit different <laughs> than others. So Fair. it's not like there's just one straight and narrow path where you're having the same conversation kind of over and over again. Right. It's more like right. a platform. And actually, this is I have another question about this for the traditional media companies, but it's more like a platform where individual voices can kind of like you know, voice their diverse opinions on the workforce, on leadership, but it's not yeah. necessarily like preordained by like what you guys think maybe they should talk about. That's right. And I mean, to your point, like when we, when, cause I've done podcasts at media companies as well. And at media companies, it was more about like, what's the biggest name with the most interesting story. It doesn't matter if it agrees. There's no point of view. It like, 
uh, at a media company, it's more like that story is the point of view that we want to share, right? Mm. The difference is like with Lattice is I have to make sure it agrees with Lattice's point of view also, right? right? Like, and it doesn't have to be prescriptive, like how to do performance reviews, for example, It, but it needs to be like, this is the right way to like treat people and like build a culture at a company can't be toxic. Like it can't be, you know, and like we can talk about Gary V in that way too, but you know, he also has some very interesting ways of maintaining culture at his companies as well. So that was like the approach we wanted to look at. And as a journalist, as a former media person, I actually really love that challenge of finding the way to tell the story in that box that mm-hmm. is limiting. Um, because like even at Britain Co., for example, or at Fandom, we had a little bit of a box. It was certainly a bigger box, but there was a little bit of a box in like how we wanted to frame stories. And um, not every guest is right for that framing, right? And so you may not want to bring on someone too edgy for an audience that's not the sort of shies away from edginess um, or maybe too like mainstream and vanilla for a geeky audience that wants to like get in the weeds. Mm-hmm. So everybody has a box. Everybody has a framing that they have to work within. It's your job as the content person, as a journalist, as an editor to make the story work for the frame and um, being really intelligent about that. Um, and then can actually like, kick ass like then it can really rock it's really interesting like as you scale up from crawl to walk to run you sort of lose a layer of control at each step um with the blog yeah. you can sort of control every word all the stylistic points um the ctas and then like you can like you said you have this box but you you still are letting go of a little bit of control especially if you have other guests on yes because i can resonate like with our with our podcast like there's big names and there's kind of a trade off here there's like big names but I know that they've talked about the same thing kind of over and over and they're very like high level. Yes. And I'm like, that's yeah. not really going to resonate with a the theme that we have going on, which is this, this long game concept, getting into the underlying principles and like more of the nitty gritty and like the advanced content stuff. So it's like, we, yeah. we can pick and choose those, but then still like with each conversation I have, like it's sort of a, um, a tightrope walk, like trying to, trying to, as a host, like maintain some sense of like control and keeping, keeping it in that box, but also you don't want to like constrain the guest and like, you know, no. crush their actual points of view. So like there is a tightrope walk there. And I do think like there is a lot that can be done. Like you do have to think that really intentionally in the preparation of your content, like whether you're interviewing someone for an article or you're interviewing some, you're prepping for a podcast or a event um, about how do I steer the conversation to the topics that A, will make this content unique, but B, help me fit it in the frame. And um, like, I just did a interview literally this morning for our upcoming conference with Priya Parker. She wrote this book, which I have on my desk called The Art of Gathering. Mm -hmm. And um, She's been interviewed dozens of times, like maybe hundreds of times about these topics. And it was like, okay, I have a theme for my conference. I have a point of view of Lattice. I have a framing for my audience. um, And I have her set of topics that she's an expert on. How do I craft like an interview and a set of questions that helps me like make this feel unique and new, but also like, gets at the the chestnuts that everybody loves that she talks about because they're going to definitely be people who are fans of hers and then also like gets at like all those touch points like what's relevant to our audience and so on so yeah they want the hits but they also want a unique experience right because otherwise they just right. watch the tedx talk or whatever that's right that's right and you need to be able to like bring the magic of the tedx talk but like like, oh, I'm here in a special moment where I'm getting something that's never been said before. Totally. Well, a question on constraints and editorial style guides. Um, so mm, yes, how do I frame this? Um, 
I'm not a fan of overly strict editorial style guides. I'll just put it out there. But like yes. my so my my thesis is that like in traditional media companies, let's say like the New York Times, let's say the New Yorker, there's this emerging trend and it's maybe not even emerging anymore, but like I think people follow individual writers. Like yeah. I follow Malcolm Gladwell or I follow Derek Thompson from The Atlantic, but I, I subscribe also to the New Yorker yeah. to the Atlantic. Yeah. So there's yeah. some balance there where like I can tell it's a New Yorker article, but there's also a unique style that Malcolm Gladwell puts on his articles in comparison to other people's. Absolutely. So I don't even know how to frame that question. <laughs> but yeah. it, it, it's like how much um free reign do you give to an author, especially if they're a subject matter expert or a guest writer who has like very it is very idiosyncratic views and how much do you try to squash that down to fit your brand style yeah. guide and like the voice that you you want to put out into the world so there are two things that we have we have the style guide which we have our own um which is really very much focused on like grammar punctuation capitalization rules this is how we refer to like we call them one-on-ones and not manager meetings, whatever. Mm -hmm. So those are like very like prescriptive, like copy editing, almost rules. Like, it's like, we always capitalize people when we're talking about an HR team, like a people team, for example. And so that's just like editing rules. And then there's like brand and voice guidelines, which I think is sort of where you're headed with this comp with this question, because there are, um, there are definitely like um, there's a certain when we're writing from the lattice point of view and we're writing for the lattice library um, as lattice, we have like a very specific tone. Like it's always friendly. We use like more positive words. We don't really like to use negative words. Like um, like we'll say um, instead of negative feedback, we say constructive feedback instead, you know, and we never say someone's dumb. We, you know, those sorts of things. Right. Those are, that's a tone rule and, and a voice rule. And sometimes we have guest writers who come in who are not on voice and on tone exactly, but we want to get their point of view. And in those cases, like that's why a byline is so important for anything you publish, um, making sure that like you set up. So like we did a guest, we do a guest call, a guest post column uh, called, um, uh, that is really uh, like uh, it's it it it's called resourceful, and it was like basically like if we want to invite new voices in to have a point of view, in some cases a hot take mm -hmm. on an HR topic, we can put it there, and it's like in a safe space where people know exactly what they're going to get. They know it's not the lattice voice, but it is an expert voice, and we always provide context about that person and why they are important. Um, we used to have a, a column on management advice um, called Ask uh, Like a Boss that was written by an author, Jen Romolini, who's written management books. And a lot of people didn't always agree with her advice, but that's her space to write her piece and her point of view. And we always had to sort of like come back to the audience and say, I get it. You don't always agree, but like, you know, this is her advice column. You can just not read it, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, and I mean, not everybody's going to take chances on those voices, right? Um, like the New York Times will obviously, because Malcolm Gladwell is a very respected voice and um, it may not be always in handshake with like the New York Times voice, but that's okay because they're there to like bring voices forward, a content marketer may not have that luxury of like sacrificing the, the, the conversation space to like a voice that doesn't hundred percent agree with whatever it is their voice is. Um, I think it's all on a case by case basis. Um, another interesting way to approach this too, is if you want to um, let's say you want to have a conversation or have content about a topic that is outside of your voice. Um, 
one thing that we do at Lattice is, so we have a community that's a Slack community of HR leaders. And there are thousands of people, like 17,000 people in this community. And they have a lot of conversations about topics we would never touch with a 10 foot pole Mm -hmm. as like a content marketing team. So like, like, for example, a few weeks ago when the Roe v. Wade uh, decision came down, we're not going to write an article as Lattice about how to support HR, how HR teams can support employees during Roe v. Wade. But we saw all these conversations happening in the community and we actually saw some fantastic advice in the community. And so we actually just asked, it was like a crowdsourcing of ideas and we literally turned their posts into an article roundup of ideas from Mm. HR leaders in the community. It has its own brand. Um, It's called RFH insights. And it was like, okay, this is from the community, not from Lattice. Um, take it or leave it, you know, Mm -hmm. but it's obviously a very timely topic. It makes us, makes us feel like a place you want to visit a destination that you want to visit when you want advice on these things. And um, we can provide it to you, but not as lattice more as like a conduit, right. From other expert areas. So in some cases you may want to go out and interview people and just do a roundup instead of like real world advice, not Lattice's advice or not your company's advice on these things. So that's another way to like mix tone and voice without sacrificing on standards. Mm, yeah, I like that idea of having a separate channel, a separate branded um, kind of tonality mm-hmm. to those pieces. This yeah. uh, One thing that I've, I've consistently run up against is like uh, when people say like, I want to build a media company within my B2B SaaS company, it's like, what yeah. is a media company? Like what defines that? And that's obviously a lot of our discussion here. So, I mean, yeah. some media companies are printing the news. Like it's basically updates yes. about like a specific thing, but one thing, and I don't know if this is a rule of media, but it seems to be a trend um, since like the roots, right? Like yellow journalism. And I, I don't yeah. know if there was a period where we weren't doing this, but uh, media companies take stances, right? Like editorial oh, yeah. boards are going to write hard stance pieces. And I think that's yeah. not something it's a scary thing for a lot of software companies to do, right? Absolutely. I do think that there are varying degrees of like, because there are like definitely media companies that play it safe too. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. You know, like Martha Stewart media is not going to take a political stance on anything. Most likely Um, they're going, they might take a hot take stance on like how to decorate a room or how to make a pie, but they're not going to have, they're not going to move out of their lane, right? Their swim didn't, lane. Didn't she partner with Snoop Dogg on something? She did. <laughs> and I would say that was like uh, not in the heyday of her media company, more right, in the right. heyday of like Martha Stewart, like building her new brand. So <laughs> fair, but fair it's point. A pivot. Yeah, yeah. It's a pivot. And, but I would say like, um, com- there are companies you know, uh, marketing teams and uh, co- businesses that will do the same thing. Like Salesforce and Mark Benioff will take a stance all day, every day, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Coinbase will say, leave your politics at home. We take those stances here, mm-hmm. you know? So everybody has like a different perspective, a different approach, right? Um, like, my, our CEO, Jack, likes to say, like, everybody's signing up for a, a purpose, right, at a company, but not all the purposes are the same, mm-hmm. right? So mm-hmm. um, we at Lattice take more of a stance on things just because, number one, our executive team has, like, a specific, like, risk they're willing to take to have that point of view. But then also, they know our audience expects us to, like, be on the right side of certain issues, right? Mm-hmm. But there are definitely like some people who sign up for a purpose that is like more like I want to have the I want to have groundbreaking technology. I want to go public. I want to, you know, um have like incredible flexibility of work-life balance. Whatever it is, like c- different companies have different 
hooks yet again, my hooks um, that everybody signs up for, for one reason or another. And usually when they fall out of love with the purpose is when they decide I'm out of here. And so um, same goes for creating content. It's like I knew coming into a large degree, how much latitude I would have um, to take points of view or not take points of view. And honestly, that is part of the box I sign up for to like, to create content within. So sometimes I'm really happy to like live in that box. Cause like, I feel like I like our box a lot. Um, sometimes I don't feel super happy because I know I have to kind of bite my tongue and not, um, not put out something, but, um, but yeah, that's part of the challenge, I think, of every editorial leader, whether they're doing it for marketing or media, is like living within. It's like, I'm it's like, yes, I signed up to be the editor in chief of Martha Stewart.com. And so I'm not going to publish an op-ed on my site about Roe v. Wade. End of story. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's obviously a lot of context there that comes and this yeah. maybe like flows back to audience intelligence and understanding their expectations. Yes. But obviously like the New York Times and the Wall Street Wall I guess I can't say the word, Wall Street Journal are gonna write takes yeah. on politics and economics and stuff like that. But it might yes. be strange if HubSpot did that, for instance. But and, and there's like a level, like not all of these takes have to be like inflammatory per se, but early mm-hmm. HubSpot at least, I think, kind of had that media company esque angle because they would take contrarian stances on marketing and how you should yes, do they marketing, would. right? Yes. So I, I still think like, you know, there's varying degrees of like what kind of a stance you want to take and what areas and those things yeah. typically do align in the lane by which your company is operating. So with us, like I, I am all about like, how is the content backed up by some sort of, some sort of credibility, some sort of gravity. Um, and like, when it comes to just like top of funnel content, it's usually like we are um, presenting like points of like points of view that come from like people we interview, right? And we shape the story based off of those points of view. Some cases we want to have a lot of stance, right? And so I really pushed internally at Lattice that we have a group within our customer care team that at our, our customer experience team um, called Lattice Advisory Services. Like we had a business need for that where we were like helping like HR leaders be smart about how to set up goals and how to like set up a uh, feedback and so on. But like I needed those people to be sort of the keeper of the best practices. This is the mm-hmm. Lattice way. You know, this is the way we're going to do all these things. And I wasn't going to publish like, this is the right way to do this unless it was backed by that group. And so like building a little bit of like an internal bench of experts was actually super helpful um, to like shaping like a strong voice that had like a real true point of view, like you were sort of pointing out, Um, like where I could take a hot take stance on something where we could like step out and say, yeah, maybe you, maybe you need to have performance reviews four times a year or whatever it is. Um, and that's like what Hubs- HubSpot was doing also is that they had a lot of internal strong expertise that usually was backed by some sort of data and uh, could say like, hey, look, we, t- we work with thousands of marketers every day and this is the way they do it. And that's the way we frame our stuff too. It's like that we work with HR teams every day. And this is the best results. This is the best practice that delivers the best results. So um, it becomes like much easier for you to be opinionated when you have an internal team or something that can help you uh, back it up. Just a quick side note that I was thinking about with HubSpot's hot takes. Kind of a funny thing is that like, they came out with the whole like anti outbound anti ads thing when they launched their inbound marketing software and kind of created that category. And it's funny, they they put out a piece, uh, they built an ads tool and they had to write an article that was like, 
actually adds R inbound if you do them the right way. And I was like, it's kind of funny. Oh, you have to like shift in position in clever. relation to like what products you're coming out with, right? <laughs> right. I mean, I think we've all had to like contort a little bit to like make a clever connection that backs up our message. But usually, you know, uh, I mean, that's, I guess that's part of, that's a, a little bit of a content job as well, right? Is to shape that messaging and make it, make it fun. That's all a part of the storytelling, the product marketing, yes. the launch marketing. It's, it's putting that clever spin on it for sure. Yeah. Um, another run thing that I wanted to bring up mm -hmm. was, I'll uh, bring, we, you can write a book. Like I worked with our, our CEO on a book that, uh, oh, that's about cool. a topic that we really wanted to own. And I mean, the main thing was like, we, there were like a bunch of business needs for this thing. It was just like, okay, we need a physical asset that we can send out to customers. And like, um, that really like captures the essence of who we are and why we do what we do. Um, that like makes our company puts our company a little bit more on the map in a more concrete way. Um, and, uh, also it became this great way of like instantly, communicating like our CEO's point of view on the things that we sell um, to new hires, to prospective hires and that sort of thing. So there was like this multi um, use case for like doing this book. And this was like an absolute beast to make. So I wouldn't, I would not recommend it to people who are not ready to like buckle in, invest a lot of time, potentially a fair amount of money, um, to making it great, because uh, nothing would be worse than to have a book out there and you're not proud of it. Um, but it is um, it is a great asset for us still. Like we send it to um, a lot of prospects who want to like learn more about us. We've actually had inbound um, interest of, with, for Lattice. Just oh, I read your book. I thought it was great. Like I want to hear more. Um, but then we also send it out in all of our welcome kits to all of our new hires as well. So um, great stuff, but it is a lot of work. Um, we got very lucky. We got um, interest from Wiley Publishing to publish it. Um, we didn't have to self-publish it. That's another route you can go. But yeah, it that's another one. But it is a very much a run mm. uh, function. I would love to write a book. In fact, I think sometimes like I started this company uh yeah. ways to eventually write a book hopefully like, we just you know produce enough revenue build a big enough audience where we can justify the expense of doing so but i would love to do that at some point something we've talked a lot about yeah you're mentioning hubs of the inbound marketing thing i think they did a book on inbound marketing as like uh, because they really wanted to own that term mm -hmm. and um, be sort of like the company known for that concept and um so like that was like a hundred percent the basis for our writing our book was just like let's really try and own this concept of like people strategy this idea hr teams have a strategy just like marketing has a strategy sales has a strategy and so on and so um and like what does that look like and so that like that that's what it has to come from is this like very like purpose-driven um mission-driven idea um, a couple observations on the the walk crawl run model, um, yeah. all in admiration. So one is that um, each step seems to flow naturally into the next. Each each next step is an extension of the previous. So yeah. in our case, like if we were to write a book eventually, we've been doing this podcast. Essentially, we've been doing research and interviewing a ton of experts in content marketing that we can then pull and put into the book in terms of quotes and frameworks and all that stuff. So it would yes. be a natural extension to start with the podcast and probably before that blog posts and like actually like our frameworks too. And then all of those yes. make the next step of the ladder easier to attain. A hundred percent. I mean, that's the other like sort of, that's the rule that both media companies and uh, content marketers use all the time is like repurpose, repurpose, repurpose. <laughs> like just like, there's never one bite at the apple for content. Like you should always think of ways that you can roll either some of the language that's used or ideas or quotes or um, whatever into the next. So like, you know, if part of your walk is taking on social media at like, 
like social media programming for your company, which is a lot of, in some cases, like a, a part of the content team, um, you need to be thinking about social media extensions for all of your content. And like, how do I, if I make a video, how will I chunk this up and make it into like social cuts for my, all my channels? And um, how do I make animated assets out of this? How do I make digi- data visualizations out of this and so on? And so the same goes for like you wanting to like turn podcast into books. Like you have a library of content to pull from. Um, you, you see a lot of common themes, a lot of common threads, a lot of frameworks that work for many. It's like, how do you take the stories and use those as backing evidence as like proof points for your frameworks that you're developing? Um, and the same was like for the book, like when we wrote this book, it was like, okay, we have this whole library of best practices. How do we take that and not reinvent the wheel and also create parity between those two assets, like library and book, um, so that they're all saying the same thing, the same voice. Um, there's no disagreement. Um, it makes sense on a lot of fronts to repurpose, repurpose, repurpose. Totally. Another thing I like about this model is that this is maybe something only people who have worked in-house at larger companies are going to understand. But like, I think a lot of content marketers and creatives in general come in, you know, flailing their arms thinking like, I want to do this creative thing and that creative thing and this insane experimental thing. But the way this is structured, it's like, it ladders up in terms of both risk reward and cost, so to speak. So like if you hire an SEO or a content agency, it's going to be maybe 10,000, 15,000 bucks a month. And you know, within a certain degree that it's going to be successful. It depends like what space you're in and like who you hire in-house, uh, external, but it, SEO and content is probably going to work. Um, you ladder up, it gets a little more expensive. The risk yep. reward ra- ra- uh, ratio is a little bit different. The, the reward Definitely. could be much higher with some of these events. And then the book yep. is going to take... I don't know, a year, two years. I'm not sure how long it it takes to write a book. um, The writing took like nine months, um, but it was like a year and a half from like beginning to end. But then you've got this huge uh, piece of quality content that's going to be evergreen and it's going to last many, many years. Whereas like a blog, an individual blog post lasts, I don't know, it depends if it ranks in search, but it's much more ephemeral in a sense. Right. Yes, exactly. And they, I think the other thing is like, they should never be seen as like equivalent, like every piece of content has like a very specific mission, right. And goal that you want to achieve with it. Um, That ephemeralness of like the SEO piece um, may really, really be needed in a certain period of time. Um, This, this is like never going to have like, a tangible number that I can track on a looker dashboard, Mm -hmm. but it will like show like, Oh, in my funnel, like on visible, like I can see like, Oh, they got sent like the book as part of this like direct mail campaign. And then they signed up for a webinar and then they read some eBooks and then they closed the deal, you know? So you can sort of see how they all like ladder up to each other, like all of the, you can see the impact of like the layers and layers of content touches that lead to like a deal getting closed. Totally. But what what I love is that um, you start with the measurable stuff that you can actually kind of prove out True. to a certain extent, instead of True. just saying like, a lot of people say like, oh, content is almost impossible to measure. You shouldn't measure it. There's all these benefits. And like, I 100% totally true. Yeah. But your boss kind of wants to see if it's worthwhile to invest in, right? right? So if you can prove that out initially, you get a little more trust, you get a little more budget, and then you can ladder up and eventually, like, I feel like you can, you have more leeway to do some of those experimental things, which are the funnest yeah. parts of our job. But I don't and, know, you got to kind of start with that, that provable stuff. The, the SEO piece is like probably the easiest piece to prove out, for example. Like, you know, you can start showing... Like we're replacing, we're able to like save X dollars on, on paid spend because we're gaining so much organic traffic out of like our SEO efforts. And that is saving us X dollars per month or whatever it is. Like those are, uh, SEO is probably the easiest business case you can make for content, a hundred percent. The other pieces are much, much harder, but like you have to have that foundation of like how the layers fit together, 
why they help each other out. Um, so like, I always, always have a business reason for why I launch things, even the things that are hard to quantify. So like, I know that, you know, if there are podcasts from my competitors out there, I need to be able to say, Hey, I want a share of that voice and we can't not be in the conversation. So I need to make, you know, I need to make a podcast and we've got to start here and it helps this other business need. And then you get the money. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, I, I will say like it helps a hundred percent if your company is already bought into, to, to content as a driver. Um, And that I have that in space. I'm so lucky, lucky, lucky that my leadership believes in the stuff we do. But that said, um, it is a, it like, it took six to nine months to get like a strong SEO showing when you're going from like zero to 10 or whatever it is, like your measure is. Um, It takes time to build an audience in podcasts. It takes time to be for people, for like good guests to come to you and want to be part of your events. Um, like I remember our first year doing the conference, like everybody's like, what is this? I don't know. And now we have like literally dozens of people asking, hey, can I speak at your conference? So um, it takes time, but it is like worth it. And like it builds tremendous brand value, um, which shows up in deals. Like you'll actually hear people bring up, oh, I love your content or I love your podcast or whatever it is. So on, on the topic of SEO, um, I, I like that you don't, like a lot of, maybe this is a misconception on my part, but like, I think mm. SEO is sometimes denigrated, um, especially when people talk about building a media company as if it's a separate channel and separate thing. But the way you talk yeah. about it, it's like a tool that can facilitate oh, your yeah. business goals with content. It's yeah. not necessarily like completely separate from the idea of building a media company. And from the experience of media companies, my understanding is that like maybe the Atlantic maybe doesn't start their stories by looking into Ahrefs and like finding a keyword, but they do really care about SEO and they have people optimizing their content so it can show up and search. So it's not like your traditional media companies, they're not ignoring SEO either. At least that's my understanding. So like at previous media companies I've worked for, we actually had, I mean, that's the importance of the content mix, right? Um, like there's a percentage of your content that you want to create that's expressly to own specific SEO topics that are important to your business in some way or another. And media companies have that too. It's like, you know, I always want to own, if like I always want to own Easter recipes or Christmas recipes or holiday recipes and like, or whatever it is. And that is like, honestly, I remember when I worked at Yahoo, like, and I did content there, it was like, Oh, we need to own chicken recipes as because there's like tens of thousands of people searching for that a day, or there probably hundreds of thousands. I can't remember. So, how do we own chicken recipes, for example? And so, there's that's like one percentage of the mix. There's another percentage of the mix that's like breaking news. Like, how do we like catch like social media traffic? Um, how do we like get attention links? People are, it's like, that's where the viral hits can happen, right? Um, and then there's like mix of like stuff that's just like you have to do it because it's like in your wheelhouse. Like we had to do like health and fitness coverage, even though we were never going to win on like SEO. We were never going to like really get a ton of value from like viral anything, but it's like part of our brand. And so we have to do it. Um, you have to think about it that way for B2B content marketing too. I mean, there's some stuff that's like the Roe v. Wade thing, for example, from RFH Insights was a perfect example of like, this is like timely. It's a, it's like a quick hit. It's something that people are talking about right now. We can easily throw it together very quickly and it's high value for that reason, right? The SEO thing, like there are certain pieces that we create and or update just to like maintain are standing like on the first page of search for a certain term. And then there's some content that we create just to like create a value for a campaign, right? Like we need to create this ebook or this article so it can go out in this like demand nurture. It is what it is. 
It's not going to have any other like real value beyond that, but it has to have some value, right? Um, so that's the content mix. And we literally do actual percentages where like when I set my OKRs every quarter for the content team, it's like we're going to we're going to uh, create 30 percent of our content to back product launches. And that includes like winning on SEO terms for that product. Right. So if we're going to launch compensation, we're going to create a new set of keywords that we want to win on and topics we want to win on. And we're going to create content around those. But it also supports like a product launch to let the world know we're getting into compensation. And then 30% that's dedicated to our new EMEA, like UK audience. We want 30% that's dedicated expressly to like the theme of our conference for this month or whatever. So you have to like really, that's what a content strategy is best for, is it gives you some like overview of like, where are all the mouths I need to feed? What are all the buckets I need to fill? Um, and filling them with the best topics that are going to win you the most points across the board. Speaking my language. I love that. A holistic <laughs> look at content strategy. <laughs> sure. Exactly. Um, did you, you study journalism in college? I did. I know. I'm like one of the, and it's so funny because all I have all these friends from my years of being in media and journalism, and I was one of the last people to get out of media and journalism. Like I, I stayed in it for so long, and uh, yeah, but yes, I did start there, and I stayed there for a long time. It seems like you found your love of writing early. I did. I really loved writing early, and it was funny because I went to school thinking I was going to go to film school. And ended up like doing some, like we had to, it was a communication program at Boston University. And we had to take all these courses across all these different communication fields. And the journalism class that we took was just so, just like clicked for me. And I was like, I like this so much better than trying to screenwrite. So let's go, let's do journalism. <laughs> That's cool. So you've, you've had this thread line of writing and communication and storytelling through your career since studying right. in college. So at this point today, what what's the driving force uh, that motivates you and inspires you in, in terms of your work? Well, it's really like providing value for the people I am creating content for. Like it's, there's nothing more satisfying to get, like when we get like, when we see comments at our, at our, at our conference, like, oh my God, I come every year because the content is so good. Or we get like a, a seller in, cause we have a Slack channel at, at Lattice where the sellers post about the deals that they close as they close them. It's like one of the most addictive channels on our Slack. And when a big deal comes in and they said, they usually tag us in the message to say like, they came inbound, they did this, they were super interested, they love our content, blah, blah, blah. Like, and that like is so deeply satisfying. And, you know, that was the same thing in media. Like when like a cover story was a hit or an article or a, pa a special package that we launched was loved by our audience. Um, it was so rewarding. It was so rewarding just to get that feeling of like, um, Oh, they liked it, you know, <laughs> like basic level. It's like, ooh, you know, Sally feel like, oh, you like me. You really like me. It was <laughs> like that. It like all boils down to that. I do like that in content, we get um, feedback and validation that proves to us that what we're putting out into the world, pouring sweat and tears into is actually useful to the world. I think that's cool. I mean, I love, don't get me wrong. I love looking at an SEO graph that is up to the right, you know, and all that stuff. And I love like seeing RSVP numbers going up and like resulting in, you know, X leads or whatever. That's all great stuff. But like the, it's more like the qualitative, like, you know, comments, feedback, sentiment, those sorts of things are more fun to me and more rewarding. I love it. All right. We're, we're basically at time. So where can people yes. find you online? Any further resources sure. you would point them to? Yes. Uh, Lattice.com uh, slash library is our content library on Lattice. Um, you can follow us on our socials. Um, uh, 
there there's a ton of content out there's obviously like the book you can buy um you can also follow me on twitter a cardwell is my handle very easy to remember hopefully and find me on linkedin if you like and uh, happy to network and sh- and uh, chat through with anyone excellent thank you so much this is a great conversation awesome thank you alex <laughs>